Hey guys, still here, and welcome back to Broken Arrow. Broken Arrow is a game that's coming up next year, 2023, and you can consider this the baby of war game Red Dragon and World in Conflict. This is a new RTS that's coming up next year, and I'm really looking forward to it. This gameplay, we're going to be discussing the things that they said on the stream, uh, things that I really like to see, things that I'm currently seeing on screen. Keep in mind, as we're going through this, that a lot of this stuff is work in progress, and there are a lot of things that I simply don't know yet. So, if I get something wrong, then that is very likely due to not having complete information. Now, this scenario, as is been shown on the Slytherin Next stream as well, is the USMC specialization. The game is going to be featuring the US and Russia as playable factions, but they will each have a customizable specialty. And in this case, we're looking at the specialty of the USMC. The USMC in this mission, which has been fully designed using the mission editor that's coming with the game, so you can create your own missions, and I wouldn't at all be surprised if you can then share those through the Steam Workshop for others to play. And this already makes me really excited about the game, because I would really love to play missions that you have created on video. That, I think, would make for excellent content, excellent gameplay, and uh, really a way for you to have your story told, essentially. And this mission editor comes with the game, so it's not like you're going to have to pay extra for this or wait for this to get released. So, um, this mission, they have a couple of different objectives. They need to destroy six Tellars. I had to look up what those are. Uh, this stands for a Transport Erector Launcher. It's basically an anti-air site. And because of these anti-air sites, there is the impossibility to do an airstrike on the primary objective, which is the fort. The USMC is trying to land on this peninsula, this island, and ideally, of course, a coastal battery that's defending the place would easily get taken out by an airstrike, but that cannot be done simply because of the anti-air in position. Now, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can already see something that really resembles the interface that you might know from Wargame, but also from Regiments. It's this interface that gives you a uh, set tick of points, currently set to plus 60, so you get one point every second. And you can call in units from reconnaissance, infantry, support, tanks, depending on what categories you have available. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is also going to be something that you can set in the editor. Now, because of those anti-air batteries, not all of the assets are going to be available. So, a thing like a helicopter is not exactly safe to fly. At least, not yet. First, it's going to come down to the grunts. The infantry is going to have to do some work. Now, what you just saw over there was a vehicle popping smoke. And that is really nice. In the stream, it was said that line of sight is critical. Much like it is in war game, much like it is in most strategy games. You can't see the enemy, they can't shoot you most of the time. Or, well, let's put that the other way around. If they can't see you, they can't shoot you. If you can't see them, they might be able to see you and still shoot you. So, not only are vehicles equipped with smoke grenades, but so are infantry, and so are tanks. So you're not only relying on your artillery in order to get a smoke screen up. Their infantry just popped smoke as they were sprinting across the street. So, line of sight, play around with it. It's going to be very useful in this game. As for uh, the ability of infantry to cross the street quickly, there is something that's called the sprint mechanic. And this does bring me to a question that I have about the game myself. How micromanagement intense is this going to be? If you're getting the ability to have infantry sprint across the street, then, in order to make use of that, you're going to have to micromanage them. You're going to have to click that squad and say, Okay, from here to there, I want you to sprint. I want you to be quick about it. Because without that, you might die. Which would be, of course, detrimental to your efforts. I've paused this bit for a second, so we can have a closer look at the interface around the infantry. From what you can see here, this used to be a 12-man squad. Except some of them have been killed. On top of that, they're panicked. There is a panic mechanic. The panic mechanic is going to work much like you're expecting from other games. It's going to make units slower, it's going to make units less effective, and it's going to overall affect the, let's say, the longevity 
because the more they're pinned down, the more likely they are to die. What else can we see? Different weapons. They have 10 standard assault rifles. Um, most likely the experts among you can tell me exactly what sort of weapon that is. There's also two who carry an, an underslung grenade launcher. There is one that carries an anti-tank weapon. And there is one that seems to carry a designated marksman rifle, if I'm not mistaken. Now, you can see that these Marines have those icons set under their specific unit icon. And with that, if that particular operator dies, you're going to be out of that weapon. This is notably different from Wargame, because in Wargame, one guy can do it all. One guy can pick up all the rocket launchers from the troop. It can carry two RPGs, you can carry two machine guns, and of course, all the ammunition from the rest of the squad, even though he's the sole survivor. Broken Arrow does not have the same luxury. The guy dies, unfortunately, you lost that weapon. Now over on the right, you see that little sprint icon, which is something that is currently reloading. So the Marines have used it, and they are currently reloading their sprint mechanic. They still have one charge left of their smoke grenade, and the attack icon, well, as much as you can expect, attack and stop, get into the building. The other one, I don't strictly know what that is. The incoming artillery strike, or maybe mark an artillery target for something, request an airstrike. I'm not sure how that works. So this is one of those things where I just can't exactly tell you how that works. But maybe the guys from uh, the Broken Arrow team are in the comment section and can help me explain what that is through a comment. Based on the gameplay here, as you're seeing it, it is pretty much the standard rules of strategy games. You lead with the infantry, you push with the infantry, but you back them up as much as you can using fire support from their vehicles. In this case, we got marines fighting building to building, and their fire support vehicles, both in the form of the LVTP-7s as well as the LV-25s, are doing as much work as possible. And from that little side street, we got one javelin team taking out vehicles. These are top attack missiles, so this is a factor. Top attack definitely works most likely more effectively rather than straight attack. However, that also makes the missile more expensive and most likely makes the troop more expensive. Again, keep in mind that the unit prices as you're seeing them here are very likely to be subject to change. They're going to be balanced, they're going to be adjusted depending on uh, feedback that the devs get, feedback that potentially we provide later on. Let's have a closer look at the UI over here and see what we can learn about calling in additional units. As opposed to other strategy games, you're limited to the amount of units that you can call in. In this scenario, it's been set that you can have four marine squads on the map at any given time, as indicated by the three slash four marines. You can have two small teams, they're both being called in. You can have one javelin team and two stinger teams. Now, for example, this is the small team, it's going to cost you 50 points. That's the infantry themselves. Then, as opposed to other games, you pick the transport on the fly. You pick how you want these guys to come in. And this is going to give you a lot of flexibility on the battlefield. Because no longer are you just stuck getting a Bradley, for example, because you already had it set in your deck. Or are you set in your ways by only bringing in airborne units? No, you can do so on the fly. You can decide, this is what I need right now. And if your transport has delivered your infantry, you can then refund it. Much like, for example, uh, Warno. Warno is still a division where you can refund your units if you don't need them. You can always keep that Osprey around and use its machine guns or GAO. The question is, is it safe? And if not, send it off, sell it, and use those points to buy something else. As for the unit over here, you can see that they have a lot of different stats available. I don't think, beyond ammunition, it's really worth looking into that too much. Because all of these numbers are most likely um, subject to change. And stuff like recon values. I mean, it says 500 with binoculars. I'm not sure if that's meters, if that's points, if that's inches. Whatever. We can discuss this as much as you like in the comments. But for now, I'm going to just gloss over it. Because it is subject to change. And most likely uh, isn't exactly full information. So it's hard to discuss for me right now. A little while later in the gameplay... The anti-air sites have now been destroyed, and that opens up the way for helicopters. So, the Ospreys, the Vipers, whatever else flying material you would like to call in, you now can. And that is going to give you all sorts of valuable elements to use against enemy infantry. 
It'll also allow for the next phase of the mission, which is going to be to take the star fort that you can already see across the way there, across the water. You can see that Ospreys are being called in, additional units are being called in, and we're going to need a bunch of these to take the next part of the objective. Since this is a marine group, these units are amphibious. So yes, amphibious crossings are a part of the game. And that's going to come in particularly useful for the next part of the operation. We're going to cross, we're going to take that star fort, and we're going to kick out anybody who still sits there. That's where these helicopters are going to come in. You can see them already coming in and sweeping around, mopping up resistance. Without enemy anti-air, this is a really nice task for something like the AH-1Z Viper. As troops have been put back into their vehicles, the vehicles can now move across the water. Now this is something that I also found very interesting when I was looking at the stream. If you have a transport that can say hold 20 guys, 20 infantry. Normally, and I'm very much comparing this to Wargame, normally you can only send one squad into that particular vehicle. Let's say it's a squad that only has three guys. Realistically seen, that gives you 17 empty seats. It's just that most games don't actually allow you to use those. This game is different. Broken Arrow says, well, there's 17 seats left, let's fill them in. And you can dynamically use squads that have taken casualties, or at least so long as there's still room, to put different squads into the same vehicle. This, of course, has upsides and downsides, being that if you completely lose a vehicle, you will also lose the squad. Well, and any other squads that happen to be aboard. So pick this carefully. Now over here we can see um, a supply pile, and this supply pile is going to be capturable. So if the enemy leaves behind supplies, and this also works in multiplayer, you can easily get those supplies, take them from the enemy, and then start to resupply your own troops from them, much like you would with the logistics unit in Wargame or Steel Division. The thing, however, is in this game you can relocate those supplies. You can pick them up, you can bring them out to where you need them, and from there, you can just see how the situation develops. Maybe you're getting pushed back a little, in which case you pick up the supplies and you move back. Or you can just push the supplies further forward. At this point, holding the Star Fortress is the main objective. And you can see that there are paratroopers coming in. So yes, paratroopers are a thing. In this part of the trailer, it was also explained that um, missiles will generally hit unless they're met with counterparts or counter um, measures. So in a situation such as this, where the Viper is having free reign because the enemy anti-air is not present, then it's safe to operate. But they only have a couple of decoys. They only have a couple of flares in this case. Once you're out, better run. Because you might find yourself on the receiving end of a bunch of missiles and you might soon not have a helicopter anymore. So making sure that you keep an eye on the um, amount of decoys that you still have left is very valuable. Which, for me again, raises the point, how much micromanagement do we have to do? In this situation, you don't have that many troops yet. It isn't that crazy. How crazy is it going to get if you get two, three, four times the amount of units? Because you might have a ton of units, but you're going to start to suffer when it comes to the micromanagement department. You cannot keep eyes on whether everybody has their flares, everybody has uh, smoke grenades ready, you can pop smoke, you can use the run mechanic, the sprint mechanic. That's seriously a question that I have about this game. How are we going to manage all of this stuff? That's going to be quite a challenge. And again, this is something that is most likely subject to change, because the game, I believe, is not slated to come out in uh, at least the first six months of the year. I think they were banking on the third, second or third quarter of 2023. So, again, uh, they probably still have a lot of time to think about this. Now, time to call in an airstrike. This is the Marine Squad, the Marine USMC, so they got the F-35B. And what I really like about the way that the airstrikes are implemented in this game is how customizable they are. Look at this. With those planes selected, you can then set what sort of bombing run you want to do. Let's see that again. This bit here shows you, you can select from what side you want the airstrike to commence. 
and also how long of a strike it's going to be. So the more you spread it out, the more area you will cover, but the less your payment might be effective because you're spreading it out over a larger area. Whereas if you drop all your ordnance on a small amount of area of space, or sorry, a small amount of space, you're going to get potentially more destructive effect. Being able to set from where your airstrikes come in will also allow you to give quite a bit of uh, mind to what side the enemy air defense might be coming from and what side your planes need to be evacuating from. So I really like this mechanic. I really, really like seeing this in the game. I believe the whole reason for sending out this airstrike is so that the building in there is going to get leveled. Yes, destructible buildings are a feature of Broken Arrow. Being able to destroy these buildings is not only a great way to deprive the enemy of uh, possession of strength, but also to allow your troops to push through that. Um, there are some interesting mechanics going around with buildings. To the tune of, if you have a building, uh, and I asked this with FLX, if you have a building such as the one that was just bombed, and you put your infantry in there, you're going to be able to not only use that building for damage reduction, but it will also give you a height bonus, which I believe means that, for example, an anti-tank infantry unit is going to be capable of not shooting a tank directly from the front, but from the top, where it is much, much weaker, which will immediately, well, substantially increase the potential damage output of any infantry squad, simply because they have that height advantage. So, taking down buildings, especially if you find that they are really difficult to, to cover, or to uh, take back from the enemy, then just simply destroying them, definitely a very valid option here. It's just gonna take you a lot of ordnance. Because they said, the bigger a building is, the tougher it generally will be. So having a really big building like one of these things is also going to make it really quite difficult to destroy. You're going to need either a lot of ordnance or some really big hits in order for that thing to go down. That, again, brings up the question, is that going to be worth it? Is that what you want? Or, in the case such as this, are you just going to drive up to it with a vehicle, drop off your infantry and just go building to building man-to-man, -man, door to door, and take the building down that way. It does strike me as this particular building group is either an objective, or it is um, acting as one group of buildings. I'm not exactly sure. Now that we've taken the objective, time for some eye candy. In this part of the video we're going into air combat, which is going to be a part of the game, but by having it sort of isolated in this specific part of the mission, it's going to showcase what it does, and it does allow you to focus on it. Which kind of brings me back to World of Conflict, where you had some sort of... How should I put this? Missions within missions, if that makes sense where sometimes you got control over a specific group of units while the rest of your units were basically uh, just taking their objective or chilling in the back, whatever you have you. Anyway, uh, these planes, bottom right hand side, have a bunch of controls. I don't know what the tactic button does, but what we do have is uh, flares slash countermeasures and pilots. A pilot just jumped out of his FA-18E as it was destroyed. Do you guys remember from Command & Conquer Generals, when you had pilots? You could rescue those. You can do the same thing here. Those pilots can be rescued, they can be brought back to base, and I believe you get either a full or a partial refund for the plane. So, this is, once again, micromanagement, but if you're able to get that pilot back, it could be worth quite a lot of points up to a few hundred points, depending on the type of aircraft that the guy just jumped out of. Because, of course, while planes are expensive, 
training pilots is going to be even more expensive. So I really like the mechanic here that you're able to get the pilot back, bring him back to base, and then use that. One of the other controls is uh, afterburner and change altitude. Afterburner is going to make your plane a lot faster, allowing you to get from one part of the map to the other faster, but that bar just under the aircraft is fuel. Run out of fuel, you're going to be running out of aircraft. Now this thing is said to, uh, <laughs> in drone speak, return to home if you run out of fuel. So if you're bingo, then you're going to have to go back to base. But you can override that. And you can say, you know what, I don't want you to go back to base. And this is something I found really interesting from the stream. You don't have to go back to base. You will have to accept the fact that you lose the aircraft. But again, if you're able to get the pilot to jump out of the plane and bring the pilot back, then you can get your plane partially or fully refunded. So that might make it worth it. That might make it so that right now, you want to lose that F-18 so you can shoot down the last of the enemy planes and potentially, I don't know, prevent an airdrop or prevent a bombing run on your troops. By doing that, you're able to get the pilot out. And by getting the pilot out, you're getting the plane back. So it's kind of sweeping your points or stretching your points out over a larger period of time, if that makes sense. Now, some part that some people might don't or might not really like is the fact that aircraft have hit point pools. You can see some of these jets getting hit a couple of times by missiles before they actually go down. Uh, think of that what you will, and let me know down below in the comments what you think of it. Do you think planes deserve to be killed off in one shot? Uh, can they take a bit of damage and still go home? Up to you. Let me know what you think down below. Anyway, the LCACs have dropped off their payload. This F-18, <laughs> as it was described, is doing a, a flyby, and you can see that on the bottom left-hand side, one of the F-18s was refunded. I'm not sure if that has to do with the plane making it back to base, or if it has to do with the pilot being brought back. I'm not sure. And I do suspect that you're not going to get the full price if you bring it back damaged. Bring back your planes in full state, in full working condition, and you're going to get a full refund potentially. Otherwise, you might not get the full price. So, now that you have another phase of the mission, you can see that we've moved on to a different part of the map, but it's still the same part of the map. A couple of pilots over there being brought to safety, and some transports being brought in to try and get those pilots out. Now, I gotta say, I do wonder where all of those LCACs came from, those hovercraft, because I do believe that they come out of an LHD, a landing helicopter dock. There's not that many of them, and I'm only seeing one LHD right off the shore. So where all the other transports came from, not really sure. Anyway, at this point, it is going to get a little hectic. Because there is quite a bit of artillery getting rained down on these units. There it comes. This is going to cause panic with units. If units get too panicked, they will likely fall back. So try and keep your units in good working condition. Try to keep your units alive. And as you can see, some of these guys are, I believe, in tree cover and getting a yellow shield, like partial damage reduction. So that not only works for infantry, but also vehicles. Marines from their ACVs getting ready to move through the forest and potentially into the buildings. But at some point, we're going to have to do something about these missile strikes. Something is going to need to get done about this artillery that just rained down. Thankfully, it seemed like nobody was really taking any damage. But, of course, it cannot stand. It cannot be accepted. Something is going to have to get done about that. You're going to see that a little later in the video. At this point, though, you can see that some of these units are getting resupplied. And that's coming out of those transports. Out of those uh, logistics units. And meanwhile, the pilots are getting picked up there. Um, with those logistics, you can get your infantry back up to full strength, so you can reinforce a squad, you can repair a tank. And this I found interesting. Much like regiments, you can also tell a unit not just to get resupplied, but to get completely refunded. So, in regiments, if you press, I think it's Q twice, you can evac a unit from the battlefield entirely. Which means, of course, you lose access to it. But it does give you the points back, and you can use those points for another unit. 
So if you find that in this particular situation, you don't really need four tanks. Maybe you just need two of them for fire support. There's the tanks popping smoke, by the way. If you just need two, you can refund two. And you can get more infantry. Depending on whether you still have some in your deck or whether the scenario allows you for more infantry. So I really like the flexibility that you have with either repairing a unit, resupplying a unit, or just getting completely rid of a unit by selling it off. Now over here the Marines seem to be doing great work, pushing forward, fire support, helping to deal damage against the buildings over there. And in the back, right there, is that artillery. Now you get access to the Arleigh Burke over there, or at least an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, and it's Tomahawk cruise missiles. So you're able to start lobbing cruise missiles at the target, and here they come. These things instantly wipe out artillery, or, well, basically, whatever happens to be under that particular rocket or missile when it comes down, <clears throat> if it's not as heavily armored as a tank, potentially. Boom. So that's most likely the artillery dead. They're not completely gone, though, because the secondary task hasn't been completed. So you're still going to have to mop up, and... Um, <clears throat> I don't know, depending on whether the enemy has anti-air defenses, maybe a helicopter or two can sneak around and do a strike on the base. Or, in the case of this player, you can just keep hitting the same position with more uh, missile strikes. More Tomahawks flying over the troops, more Tomahawks potentially on their way to successfully destroy the MLRS. And there we go, now they've been destroyed. At this point, the Marines have taken some of the buildings, the rest of the fire support can move up after they've been repaired. And it all seems to be going really quite well with this mission. Now, I really like what I'm seeing with this game. I really, really like it. It's something that just makes me go, yep, I want to play this. Uh, ideally now. <laughs> Sadly, we're going to have to wait a little longer for that. Because it's simply not out. And it's going to take a while longer before the game comes out. Um, I really like what I'm seeing. It's not a simulator, as was said. It's a game that uses realistic weapon systems, like real weapon systems that we have now. It also uses prototype units. It uses units that might have already left service a while ago. It's not all strictly to try and make everything as realistic as possible. It is a game. It is gameplay first, realism second... Um, and I personally really like that, but I know that some of you are really hardcore and might not appreciate that as much. Anyway, based on what you're seeing on screen, let me know down below in the comment what has you most excited. The aircraft mechanic, perhaps? How you can micromanage your aircraft? How you can set your airstrikes? Infantry being able to carry smoke grenades? Helicopters getting refunded after being used? You got a lot to pick from. Um, I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm going to stop saying that. I'm really excited, and um, I hope you are too. Keep an eye on the Broken Arrow video channel, YouTube channel. I'll link that down below in the description. And, of course, if you really like to keep up with the game and already know that you might want to buy it, hit the wishlist button on the Steam page. I'll also link that in the description. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed what you've seen. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing in the comments what you think about it, what you look forward to, and maybe what you don't like. Maybe we can still give the devs some tips as the game is still work in progress. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. and see you soon for more.